Sony's PlayStation isn't a console filled with long-lasting mascots. Unlike Nintendo or even Sega with their colorful cast of memorable mascots and characters, the PlayStation through the years only has a few solid franchises that remained completely exclusive to the platform. It makes sense when you look at PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale with its no Spyro the Dragon. There is, however, one franchise that's lasted for generations, Gran Turismo, baby. But actually, I'm here to talk about Ratchet Clank. I just don't know where to begin. Maybe they didn't have themselves a PlayStation 1 adventure, but these two goobers and Kratos are pretty much the PlayStation icons these days. And I guess Nathan Drake? Insomniac's Ratchet and Clank is one of my favorite gaming franchises like ever. I don't know what it is, but the lighthearted adventure run and gun platforming action always struck a chord with me. It stuck to this formula where you're traveling planet to planet, hanging out with the locals, getting and upgrading guns, which by the way are over the Top. If you want to just shoot a normal pistol thing, you can, sure, whatever, but also you could be forcing people to dance, you could turn them into pixels, or be listening to Mr. Zircon's ramblings of death and destruction. However, and very strangely, Ratchet & Clank isn't a game that's been imitated often. Now, the series was never known for pumping out sales on the same level as, say, your Halos or God of War, but it was definitely something that had an audience. I've always considered Ratchet to be the more modern version of the classic Nintendo 64 platformers of yonder, and people love cute little animal dudes, right? Yo, where are my furries at? And well, I did it. I scavenged across space and time itself to pinpoint what I'm gonna proudly call Ratchet & Clank clones. Games that are very clearly inspired by the Lombax and Robot duo, some shameless, some not. I have two major quantifiers for this. Arbitrary, sure, but y'all are gonna argue with me in them comments anyway, so do what you will. Number one, 3D platformer with an emphasis on weapon-based combat. There's a lot of platformers out there, a majority of which have you jumping on people's heads or doing a one, two, three smack. Ratchet, on the other hand, gives you a plethora of weapons to use that you can upgrade. I think this one's kinda easy. It might not control exactly the same, but it does feel familiar. And number two, wow. the vibe. Ratchet and Clank has a very specific thing going on with the characters, the humor, and the storytelling. It was like pre-Marvel Cinematic Universe styles of comedy, but with a hint of earnesty. So yeah, that lighthearted thing you might also see in like Jack and Daxter. I mean, look, if you're a dude with another smaller and potentially sassier dude on your back and you're shooting guns at people, you might be in this video. But when it's a Ratchet vibe, you know it. So yo, it's Austin, and today I'm gonna take us into the small but ever-growing world of Ratchet and Clank clones. Will there be anthropomorphic characters? Yes. There's gonna be platforming, there's gonna be running and gunning, but most importantly, there's gonna be a lot of PlayStation 2 games. There's a decent amount of games to pick from, but why not start with one that needs a remaster sooner rather than later? Metal Arms Glitch in the System. This was a hidden gem back then, and it's still one today. Metal Arms Glitch in the System is one of the absolute coolest video games on the sixth generation of video game consoles. It was the debut of Swinging Ape Studios, a company that is made of ex-Midway developers. It's also the only game they made before being sucked up into Blizzard and starting work on StarCraft Ghost, and we all know how that went. To call Metal Arms a cult classic would be an understatement. The initial concept was a bounty hunting game that would have you hopping around the galaxy and taking down the big ones. Then it eventually formulated into Metal Arms, a game where you control a cute little robot with a vaguely similar appearance to Clank, but a little less cute and a little more I'm going to shoot you in the face two times. This little guy's name is Glitch, and he's brought into a world that's filled with conflict involving a generic empire versus rebellion style plot but that's totally fine. It's the droid wars. You're gonna run around, shoot a bunch of robots, do a bunch of platforming, and upgrade your weapons a la Ratchet and Clank. You'll find a little, uh, washers lying around, which you can turn in for new weapons, items, or upgrades as the game goes on. And the shopkeepers are cute. I like them. Oh yeah, this game's like ridiculously difficult. Like, it's kind of messed up sometimes. Metal Arms has a reputation of being a very challenging game, and I'm all here for it. It's got the same vibes as, say, playing through Halo on Legendary, where you'll end up replaying the same sequences over and over, all while tanking the floor with your broken robot corpse. Beautiful. <laughs> but with some persistence and keeping up with your upgrades, you can do it. They certainly don't make games like this anymore, but I sure wish they would. Metal Arms falls right in the middle between Ratchet and Clank and Halo, actually. The world and vehicles feeling like you'd be in a warthog or 
Mr. Ghost, and all the weapons are over the top, feeling right in place in Alombax's hands. It's even filled with a bunch of quirky, over the top humor. Sometimes you'll have to assume control of another character, and I'm surprised at how animated they made them all look. They have a little bouncy steps going on, and they feel like they're from a cartoon. They somehow feel more animated than some of the things you'll see in this video too, and like, they're robots. This just goes to show you how much care Swinging Ape Studios put in the metal arms. Plus, they curse at you sometimes. Of course I f***ing fixed him. It was a huge pain in the f***ing waistband, cause he's some kind of I don't even know job. if that's PG! 13 year old me thought this was the coolest thing ever. It also had some extremely fun multiplayer that was good with friends no matter the console that you were playing it on. Like I said earlier, some games need to get themselves a remaster or port, and Metal Arms is extremely high on that list. When Blizzard acquired Swinging Apes, they took the Metal Arms IP with them and it's gone a whole lot of nowhere. Considering it's been like over 16 years now, uh, I don't think that's gonna happen anytime soon. So for now, if you wanna play Metal Arms, and you should, cause it's freaking amazing, you know what to do. Thankfully, you can play this on a 360, but that's like 16 years old now. Let's just hope that one of these days, someone wakes up, relinquishes the Metal Arms IP, and allows some people who care to do something with it. Like, like me, give it, give it to me. Next up, I wanna talk about a game whose cover is kinda like the midway point of like a Capri Sun ad from the 90s and an Animorphs book cover. In uh, 2004, we'd get another Ratchet and Clank clone simply called Scalar. Uh, okay then. Let's just start with a 12 year old electrocution torture sequence. Nice. Scalar feels absurd. You place this little kid named Bobby Jenkins with his terrible greaser supersonic haircut. He's a, okay, let me, let me run this down. He's an animal activist specifically for lizards who gets kidnapped by the military who are actually reptile aliens disguised as humans. Then while being electrocuted, he turns into a lizard thing before escaping into a portal and beginning a platforming adventure. Adventure, or as the back of the box says, his reptile exile. Scalar here was developed by Artificial Mind and Movement, A2M, who we've talked about a few times here. Not gonna make the obvious joke. They were really like the arbiters of middle of the road licensed games back in the day, and you'd probably recognize them from the Iron Man MCU game. But let's not forget about their magnum opus. Uh, this game. These days, they go by Behavior Interactive, where their biggest success has to be Dead by Daylight, but this is about Scalar, this blue cryptid who grinds on rails and slaps dudes around. Yeah, no, not Sonic, Scalar. At first glance, this looks like your standard platformer, but it shares a lot in common with Rat. It. On gameplay alone, Scalar requires new abilities to traverse and platform with, like the gadgets from Ratchet and Clank. These get powered up with like little orbs you find, like quantified evolution, I guess, whatever this is. You're kind of just thrown straight into the gauntlet here, with Scalar being extremely okay with his newfound scaliness. And <laughs> in fact, this kid is practically the Omni Furry. Instead of collecting guns, you'll collect new animal forms that you can turn into. Beyond your standard three hit combos that have a very similar oomph to the wrench and it, you can tongue things and that literally feels like you would have a pistol with unlimited ammo. This mouth muscle will wreck a majority of everything on screen and I too would be afraid of an electrical lizard running at me tongue out and ready to murder. Not into it. Then there's Leon. Freaking Leon. Anytime these two talk to each other, it's some weird hellscape of terrible voice acting and extremely awkward cutscenes trying to mimic a very certain game. <laughs> we got company and it's big! And sometimes a screen full of Lizzy Glizzy. Weirdly though, uh, Scalar's pretty fun. If you distill this entirely down to the gameplay, the core of running around as Scalar, slapping dudes around and tonguing them, and the sheer variety of ways to play due to the transformations, there's a good bit going on here. Sometimes an entire level will be a racing mode with the ball form, or a long boss fight that's a first person shooter sequence. This variety is really reminiscent of Ratchet, and Scalar looks and plays like a real ass video game. It's just very, very generic. It has character that try to be funny or edgy, but instead just annoy. It's just kind of dumb, and you don't care about the main character at all. But it's got all of the Ratchet staples, the large environments with items to collect, and in this case, eggs, big boss fights, and lots of upgrades to your moveset. I think it just drops the ball in the uh, shame that I feel when someone walks into the room factor. That is, if you can even see what's going on. Why is it zooming out so much? I can't see. Uh... Scalar, I hate this kid but I kind of like this game. 
So let's move into the realm of licensed video games. Now in concept alone, something like Looney Tunes doesn't sound like it would be a bad idea for a Ratchet & Clank clone, and well, there is one called Acme Arsenal for the 360 without a cover, because that's the, that's the quality you get here. Oh, oh God. Maybe it's nostalgia, but I totally miss the age of constant low budget licensed games. They definitely exist nowadays, but you're not being thrown a ridiculous amount of games based off your favorite cartoons, movies, and anime. There were so many that they'd easily fall into obscurity going in one ear and out the other, or in some cases, you had no idea they existed. This was basically me and a majority of the Looney Tunes games that were released in the 2000s. Now, when I was a kid, if there was a Bugs or a Buster Bunny on the cover, I'd beg my parents for it. But once I was a cool teenager dying over and over in Final Fantasy XI, trying to understand a single mechanic, I completely lost track. Y'all ever play Loons, the Power Stone clone? <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame you. So, 2007, Looney Tunes Acme Arsenal for the PlayStation 2, Wii, and 360. This was the first game developed by Red Tribe, an Australian developer who would go on to make Space Chimps, the Jumper video game, and uh, Harry Balls. Yeah, that'll sell. Acme Arsenal is a 3D platformer where you take control of a bunch of different Looney Tunes. One with a bunch of awfully cursed cutscenes, terrible camera controls, and enough wacky guns to make Insomniac blush. When you think about it, a uh, Looney Tunes inspired Ratchet and Clank clone sounds great. I mean, it's Acme Arsenal, the fake corporation responsible for all the terrible weapons and traps that Wile E. Coyote sell phones with. They have a huge backlog of amusing gadgets and guns that you can use that'll actually do damage instead of to just yourself. And for the most part, they do a good job of incorporating these guns. The problem is, it's awful. Acme Arsenal does not feel finished. The combat is rough in all aspects. The camera has a mind of its own and nothing has any impact. You've got melee combos, which will be what you use about 70% of the time as every gun has limited ammo. And for some reason, you have a green bullet health currency that influences how strong your attacks are. A lot of tunes are represented, but they all feel practically the same. Although I gotta say, seeing Foghorn Leghorn with a giant shotgun is a little odd, let alone him and Taz riding a motorcycle through the trenches of World War II. You're traveling through a theme park of levels via isekai portals, and well, it's it's just a bunch of nonsense. Kinda what you would expect from one of these games, so no foul there, but it plays so awfully that it's just annoying. Levels go on for a really long time. The two characters you control have separate life bars and guns, so there's no reason to play as both in a level. You can play this multiplayer Player, but that's never gonna happen. And it's only difficult because of how glitchy it feels and the fact that all the enemies are sponges. There's no legitimate challenge. You have currency in each level to buy weapons with, but sometimes that totally bugs out and you have negative money. Looney Tunes Acme Arsenal is the worst. Normally I'm a sucker for games based on my childhood cartoons, but not this time. Not even if it's a Ratchet and Clank clone. Blah, 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 better than God Hand, moving on. So let's move forward to today, or yesterday, really. The PlayStation 4 didn't really have many adventures with the Lombax and Robot Duo, and I'm not really sure why. Now, we did get the one remake in 2016, which apparently a lot of people hated, but I liked, which means I'm probably crazy, but there were a few clones that did come out on this generation, and I kind of like to look at them as like the root A and B of what Ratchet could have been on the eighth generation of consoles. So why not start with a little indie digital title called Skylar and Plux. The name probably sets off an alarm. Same cadence, same amount of syllables, same furry looking main character, except she's blue, kinda like Rivet. Am I saying that there's any similarities between the two? Absolutely not, but Skylar here has a real big robot arm and oh, oh God. Skylar and Plux was made by a small indie developer from Sweden called Right Nice, and as far as I can find, this is their only game. And you know what? For a little indie made by what, like 11 people, Skylar is pretty neat. I saw this thing pop up on PSN and I had to pick it up right away, knowing I'd play it or cover it at some point. And well, I sure am glad I did because earlier this year it was removed from all digital store shelves. Apparently the publisher, Grip Digital, had some issues and they removed a bunch of games from Steam, PlayStation Network, Xbox Live, the works. So, let's look at it. You play as well, Skylar and Plux, of course, an anthropomorphic cat who teams up with an owl named Plux, who, well, if I'm being honest, is an extremely annoying character. You know the whole sidekick spiel where they have to constantly play the fool while making several fourth wall shattering references all in a voice closer to Toad than a normal person. Another one bites the dust, huh? Ah, would you look at this dingus? Hey, your big head is blocking the way. Would you look 
look at this dingus? Would you look at this dingus? Would you look at this dingus? You find yourselves on a small island filled with a bunch of Loa, a native race, small friends who help Skylar gain new abilities, and she goes through the open world and little formatted levels. It's kind of reminiscent of both Ratchet and Jack and Daxter in the way that it plays. You'll unlock gadget style upgrades for your metal arm that can do different things. You can slow down time, move objects with an anti-grav technology thing, and hover around very similarly to Clank's jetpack. There's lots of platforming to be done and a lot of jank to see as well. I'm sure there's intended routes to go here, but I prefer to sandbox it like Balan Wonderworld or Skyrim. The story is told through mostly static art pans, which are actually well drawn and look nice, but the voice acting's a little hit and miss. Ah. Dang it, you imbecile. I was finished in about three hours and wanted more, but unfortunately, there just wasn't anything else to do. Look, it's it's janky. Of course it's janky. It's a 3D platformer made by an indie studio. There's limitations there. I would have loved to see this move forward with a bigger budget and maybe a better publisher, but it seems like the fate of Skylar and Plux is kind of up in the air. I'd like to think that Skylar and Plux is kind of what happens if Ratchet goes forward with like the quest for booty formula, where you take smaller scale adventures and have more of an emphasis on like melee combat and the gadgets specifically. 3D platformers weren't really a big deal for a while there, which is kind of what made like that Kickstarter for ukulele such a big deal. So on the other side of the pond, what happens if you take something like Ratchet and Clank and throw it into a giant open world with all of the modern open worldness? I'd like to think you get something like Biomutant. I was very excited for this game. Ever since I saw the original trailers and pre-orders pop up in like 2017, I felt like it was right up my alley. I mean, look, you can create yourself a little cryptid furball that looks like a hybrid of a possum, beaver, or whatever animal you can think of. You can give them a gun, you can give them two guns, a big ass sword, and psychic powers, and you can unleash into this massive open world where you can create chaos. That sounds great. Also developed in Sweden for some reason, Biomutant was made by smaller developer Experiment 101. I don't know what Sweden's fascination with furry 3D platformers is, but I'll take it. This game came out this year, 2021, to very, very mixed reception, and I always thought that that was a little unfair. It was a game made on a smaller budget, but that smaller budget was being compared to the huge AAAs coming out around the same time, including the latest Ratchet & Clank, Rift Apart, and it got promptly critically destroyed, made several worst of the year lists, and went in one ear and out the other. That's a shame too, because I think Biomutant has a lot to offer. It's an action RPG that follows the ever omnipresent open world formula you see in a lot of AAAs, but it's also one with a decent amount of personality and some fun combat. You'll be shooting dudes, smacking them around, and blasting them with ridiculous psi energy powers. You'll level up, increase all your stats, get new stuff. There's definitely a lot of creativity in the world and your powers to be seen. It does get a little repetitive and tedious though. It's a bit more limited with the guns since it wanted to be a semi-looter shooter style thing, but anytime I look at Biomutant, all I can see is this alternate universe where Ratchet and Clank became an open world game. There's weird quirks with the majority of all the voice acting being done by a narrator and the existence of a morality system, but the world itself and the combat are fun enough to warrant a play, I think. It's got nowhere near as much personality as Ratchet, but I think in the right mindset, this can be a fun one. It just maybe shouldn't have launched at $60 in the same two week period as Rift Apart. That was a mistake. I think if you could snag this one on sale though, there's some fun to be had. A really weird, pretty janky, fun, and definitely furry time. All right, we got one more game to tackle today, and I think it's definitely the most weirdest. Now, everything we've talked about so far is a clone in like the Doom sense, where it's similar or has a lot of inspired by features, but what about something a little more blatant? This here's Rough Trigger, the Vanacore Conspiracy. Hello, Ruff. Do you need help? Or just me? Oh god. Rough Trigger is what happens when you combine Ratchet and Clank with werewolves. An extremely hot combination in 2006, merely a year after the world was changed by Stephanie Meyer's Twilight. Let's not even act like we don't live in a post-Team Edward and Jacob society. This here is rough. A dog thing voiced by David Gassman of Rayman fame. Though I'm not sure if it's the way the cutscenes are or his delivery, but it sounds uh, not great. We've only got a couple of minutes. Vamanos. Oh, I love it when you sweet talk me. Hey, did you miss me a little? Come on. Of course I did, baby. 
But get your rear in gear, or eat my dog. Okay. Rough Trigger is the first game by Italian developer Playstus Entertainment, and this is probably the game they're most famous for. You play as an anthropomorphic bounty hunter thing with a bunch of quirky guns as you travel planet to planet collecting items and shooting dudes. A completely, totally original idea. Do not steal. This is one of the weirdest games I've seen on the PlayStation 2. It's very, very obviously trying to imitate Ratchet and Clank, and it somehow does it in the most uninspired manner possible. Every level is the same drab looking environment with the same enemies over and over. For some reason, instead of focusing on combat, which is mediocre at best, you're constantly doing this thing where you have to pick up these little alien dogs called piglots and sending them up into space via glowing blue things. Once you get enough, a door or elevator will activate and then you can move to the next level. The major selling point here is that you get the ability to transform into a werewolf thing where you can miraculously cast spells, so it's almost Sonic Unleashed except it's done via a toggle. Though why anyone would want to play is that when you can shoot things blows my mind. So then, that's the entire game. The entire slow plotting, borderline run and gun escort mission, blatant ripoff of a game. Made in 2006, by the way, so you could be playing up your arsenal at this point, and you should have been. We were doing alternate universes earlier, and this one is kind of like one where Ratchet and Clank sucked. Although weirdly, the music's pretty good. It's just like almost inappropriate for what's going on on the screen. You'll be like collecting dogs and throwing them into like mini blue UFO holes and then a Metal Gear Solid riff starts going off. Literally the only thing that stuck in my mind from this entire experience is the fact that they gave Ralph a female cat girl companion named Cecily, who drives a motorcycle and has massive anthrobops. Like it's ridiculous. And whenever she shows up, you can drive your motorcycle for a bit, and these are like the only relatively interesting levels in the entire game. But they're over in like three minutes. And your only reward for trudging through all these dark and repetitive levels are short little mini games, which aren't really anything at all. I guess if I had to sum up this entire experience in one word, all I could really say is that Rough Trigger is rough. Okay. That's all I got for today. Now the world of Ratchet and Clank clones is still small but ever growing and there's a lot of small cool early access indie games on Steam that kind of lean into that direction. Now, hopefully I didn't miss anything because I was as thorough as I could possibly be, but if I did, please let me know down in the comments and I would love to check them out. If you take one thing away from this video though, it's that you gotta play Metal Arms. That game rules. Anyways, I've been Austin, and catch me next time when we do the annual suffering. Thank you so much for watching. Special Patreon shout out to Blackfoot Ferret, Brandon Howell, Chris Shelton, Christopher Olivia, Darren Newton, DX Buster, David Molnar, GM Pinks, Irrational, Jay Roos, Jacoby Fitzpatrick, Jordy McCaffrey, Kevin Zanowski, Kieran Arder, Nick Irving, P Funk, Randall Bentley, and Ryan Talbert. Thank you so much for your generous support. Thank you so much for watching the video. I enjoyed making the video. I enjoyed playing like half of the games, but we got a lot more things that I want to talk about coming up real soon on the horizon. I got another deep dive. I want to do. Got the worst of the year. And maybe a little surprise here and there. I promise I didn't disappear for Endwalker. I'm still here, baby. Catch you guys next time.